What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Walkout Network. It's your man, Ant Walker, here with another edition of Unleash, the weekly panel discussion show. And as always, have a fantastic panel. These two gentlemen need no introduction, but we love them so much. We're just going to do it anyway. Let's start off first with the jack of all trades, who has mastered them all, the senior editor of Sherlock.com, and my man, Ben Duffy. What's up? Hey, I'm doing really well. This week, I am mastering the uh, trade of making espresso. I uh, treated myself to an espresso machine. Uh, just you know i i went uh out to you know salt lake city for a week and stayed with a friend who has an espresso machine and it just introduced a need into my life that i had not been aware of i got back home and literally two days later i just yelled at my coffee machine because it was taking 10 minutes to make a pot of coffee like what is this the fucking stone age and next thing you know the, the big box from amazon shows up on my front step and it's been great and you know what you're doing it forward see my household did it backward our coffee machine just started doing the same thing taking 10 minutes to brew one cup so instead we went back to instant coffee temporarily so <laughs> um, yeah things things have downgraded in the walker household as far as coffee is concerned are and you aware before, that you're drinking folgers crystals right now i don't even think it's folgers I, I don't know what brand it is i think i think i just saw it like ah oh, that's cheap and i just threw it in the cart um but you know you know that's how i operate so of course Every week, the panel is anchored by the man with the stats, the facts, the figures, and the numbers. He is the associate editor of Sherlock.com. Also, my good friend, Mr. J. Petra. Jay, what's up? Um, I am doing great this week because this week felt like a win for the old guys. Now, I am not quite the old guy when it comes to the MMA media sphere, unless you look at like Lucas Grandsire, Cole Shelton. You know, the, the young guns are like 16 or so. I don't really know. I can't keep track. But this week had some really old lions getting the job done and and it's it's hard to root for fighters as media you don't want to do that because if, if you encounter them or work with them you take some of the impartiality about it but you sometimes get a good feeling in your chest when like jim miller does a thing and jim miller of course did a thing this past weekend and he is the subject of the stat of the week because he had his 38th ufc fight 38 fights in the ufc that's i mean obviously that's a record and he and Donald Cerrone keep on twisting and turning up their line, but 38 fights, and he's 38 years young, which, okay, that's kind of cool, and he's probably going to fight 10 more times before it's all over with, so you might hear him come up as the stat of the week again, but 38 fights in the UFC alone. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty long career, so... Um, yeah, shout out to Jim Miller. I'm sure we will discuss him a little bit more in detail later, uh, but first... Um, I mean, once again, we 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 didn't want to go there, but we have to go there. Um, last week, we started off with um, some of the misadventures of the UFC roster. One of those misadventures has now turned into actual uh, action by the promotion. Luis Pena, uh, who was um, arrested very recently for a domestic violence charge, and this was off the heels of another domestic violence charge. <clears throat> he has now been released by the promotion. Um, Michael Graves, who was uh, released in 2017 for the same thing, he had a um, disturbing Twitter rant <clears throat> over the weekend, um, specifically targeting a friend of the show, a colleague of ours, Amy Kaplan, a, a fan sided. I mean, we'll talk more about Amy a little bit later because um, – things get more interesting as far as she's concerned uh sorry amy if you're watching um but we love me you, and her have, have talked so she knows she knows what's up um what's it gonna take for the ufc to follow suit with one jonathan dwight jones um what's up gentlemen let my laughter be most of the answer for that question like this is this is the clearest example Dana said when the Jones situation, the most recent, oh my God, I have to qualify it. When the, when the September, September or October, 2021 incident occurred for one Jonathan Dwight Jones, Dana went, we're going to have to look into it to see what happens. We're, you know, we're looking through for the police report, which was already out, which I personally wrote up and put together for the sure dog news, you know, coverage. So the police report's out there. So we know what he did. We know the the story of the, the the bloody face and the bloody sheets and the the kids running down to the desk to say, "Call, can you call the cops?" So that information is not like a "I wonder what happened" kind of situation. And then, right as the Luis Pena story comes out, 
they cut they cut ties with them all together. I I mean it's not even a double standard at this point. It's it's a famous not famous. There's a, there's a drop chart out there on Twitter. I wish I could say who who created it, but it it dropped down about if are you famous? Do you make money for the company? And Luis Pena is not a big money name for the company. Had he been a former champion, a a pay per view type of guy, it might have been different. I don't know what John Jones is going to have to do to to get let go from his contract. I don't think he would. But here's a weird situation. thing I want to bring up to both of you because I've been kind of chewing on it for a while. If the UFC let John Jones go, where would he go? No one can afford him. Like this is John Jones who will sit out of fighting because he's not paid $20 million or whatever he's asked for. Bellator ain't got that money. PFL doesn't have that money. One championship sure isn't going to be, if they're going to go their Bushido honor or all that nonsense, they're not picking up John Jones. Ryzen who? No one, Kombach Global. No one's going to pay him. So if John Jones were to get let go, it's not like he'd be fighting for another company. No, I, I, um, I seriously think if he were let go by the UFC, his next thing would be like boxing a Paul brother. I would think that. Or that that's, that's really the only thing he could do with gloves on that, you know, could make I'm, him anywhere near what he thinks he's worth. I, I disagree. I, I think if John Jones were out on the free market, the morals and standards, if that's a thing of fight promoters, would go completely out of the window and he would get picked up and they would find the money somewhere. They would give him a bigger cut of pay-per-view. They'd give him a cut of the gate. They would do something. Um, and maybe it wouldn't necessarily be in mixed martial arts. Maybe it'd be boxing. Um, it could be celebrity boxing. It, it could be something of, of that sort. But this is also the sort of guy where you can structure an entire card around. Golden Boy MMA had their sole event based on two relics of the past who damn near limped out to the cage. Um, you could have a decent enough card with John Jones as the headliner against whoever you want, and it will draw attention and it will sell. Um, so I think he is sort of a game changer, like a Nate Diaz, where if he's out there on the market, the, the market will dig up the money from somewhere. Um, so he he's someone who can write his own ticket, which is exactly why the UFC is not letting him go. Um, same thing with Conor McGregor, who beat up an Italian DJ or something over the weekend. Oh, my God. I mean, this is the exact yeah. same sort of thing. Yeah. Luis Pena is, is not the guy who's going to – who's going to uh, shake up the cage as far as pay-per-view numbers are concerned, or even ratings for, for that matter. So he could slide into a Bellator and no one would really pay it any, any attention. John Jones and Conor McGregor, on the other hand, are not those sort of fighters. They demand marquee status and rightfully so because they draw in the money. And, and, and Duffy, I guess this is my question to you. What would the either one of those gentlemen have to do given the allegations the accusations the investigations like conor mcgregor has been publicly multiple times investigated for rape and sexual assault so like what at what point would the ufc say nah i i don't know i don't know at this point would he have to kill somebody like this is the conor second random fight scuffle thing in a month i i I don't think there's anything that will that will force the UFC's hand. It, it will take an actual criminal conviction that leaves him either unable to get into the U.S. or actually incarcerated. You know, and even if he were incarcerated, they just hold on to his contract. Well, if Jeremy Stevens is going to be fighting tonight, though, <laughs> and dude, I, that have you that ever seen the movie Jeremy Undisputed? Stevens. Hey, man, all I'm saying is Conor McGregor versus Boyka. I watched that Undisputed Fire and, and see, Five. The, the Jeremy Stevens thing wasn't even about Jeremy Stevens. That was just about Dana White's reflex reaction to people telling him what he can and can't do. It could have been any fighter. And he was just going to be like, no, you you know, nobody's going to stop me from doing what I want to do. Yeah, I, I think fair, fair points on that. Um, man, I... I, all right, so let's 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 get into the the other part of this story that I find interesting, and this is where John Jones plays an even bigger part in this. Um, you know, friend of the show, Amy Kaplan had quite the interesting week. Within the span of, I think it was like three or four days, yeah. she became the target of two uh, alleged domestic abusers in the sport, and her being a domestic violence survivor herself, you know, not a good look. I mean, to to be threatened in dms by michael graves and to be name called and 
you know, and, and ridiculed by John Jones just within, you know, within the span of, of a couple of days, like what the hell is wrong with these people? I mean, that's kind of the only question I'm left to ask. What the hell is wrong with him? I, I have this weird impression and I don't know why I have this impression. Maybe it's because of other sports for, you know, all of the years I've been alive. This doesn't happen. We're going after the media is almost like storming an embassy. Like it's, it's, it's something you maybe, okay. If a, if a reporter factually mis mistook something you said, or, or there's an actual error that the reporter made, you can, you can address them head on, but otherwise to attack them personally, that just sounds like, like it, I, the word, the word faux pas isn't even close to, to what has been said the past few days. It just seems like something that wouldn't happen in other other major sports i don't maybe i'm missing something other than weird uncomfortable interactions by single isolated actors but this is like michael graves a self-avowed proud wife beater who who publicly admit that he did the things that he was accused of and charged with and and john jones who <sighs> it's not looking good for 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 the allegations that came out versus you know what what the results that have happened and and the the videos that he has released that the one where he's he's kissing his fiance and that we all got those really uncomfortable vibes because it feels like a like a like a hostage video or something like, like he should like be a, holding a newspaper up next to her head it's, yeah. like, it's, it was a stage of abuse uh, it's, that we it, were that's exactly that that's exactly what it felt like and i am so uncomfortable that it is becoming like this. I like Amy a lot. Personally, she's a friend of mine. So to see her go through this thing as a as, as the one person who shouldn't be attacked about this. Like she's like me as somebody who hasn't been involved in this situation. If you were to go after me because of something I said, okay, maybe it's because of something I said. But as but not only is she a media member, but she's somebody who has been through the worst of this. And then to attack her for her views, her rightful views on domestic violence blows my mind. Like, and, and why? she, and the thing is one, she wasn't saying anything like no. outrageous, like domestic abusers should be held accountable. Like, yeah. like, yeah. like, and that I saw didn't call either of these people out by name. In fact, who, where the fuck did Michael Graves come from? Like I, I had, I had it's to be reminded, unfortunately, that he's even a thing. He 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 came out looking like looking like Oso from Snowfall. Like that that's what that's what he looked like. He, he, um, I don't I, I, I you know forgive me for stuttering over my words because I'm my mind is blown by this. Here's a novel idea because Amy did not say anything groundbreaking. She didn't say anything new. She didn't add or embellish anything to the story. Um, especially in John Jones case, like this yeah. is, we're, we're reacting to the actual police reports, to the police reports that, that paint a very dark picture, a disturbing picture, one that makes people worry about the safety of the females in that household. Um, and anybody with half a brain would be concerned about the, the young children yeah. and his fiance that are in that house dealing with, you know, some impaired version of perhaps the greatest martial artist that's ever walked the face of the earth. I think that's, a, that's a fair thing for someone to be, be worried about. Um, so if you are John Jones, if you are Michael Graves and you are attacking somebody because their reaction to your domestic abuse, how about don't be a domestic abuser? If you don't commit heinous acts, there are no heinous acts for us to report. There are no heinous acts for us to comment on and opine about. Seems really basic. If you don't want people to say bad things about you, don't do something bad that someone can say something about. And and if I remember correctly, her initial statement was talking about how you know doing this around or in front of children is normalizing the behavior by making kids think it's acceptable to to be abusive in these situations, which is rightful. It's legitimate. It's backed by psychological studies. You know, if if you want to go down the rabbit hole. What what she had said is is perfectly reasonable, and it wasn't incendiary. It wasn't the kind of thing that says you son of a. It was it was saying you know this is this is the kind of thing that will instill behavior in children if they witness this bad behavior and witness it go unpunished, and it seems like an acceptable thing to do or something you can get away with doing if you do if you however it goes about. It will not be good for children. 
<laughs> that's a novel concept, but it's something that she drew ire from. What, what point to me on you know on on the on the tweet where she said something wrong, where she was out of line, where she anything like that, but a myriad of people, including John Jones and Michael Graves, went after her for that. What? What is there possibly to be gained from this? I am I am a different person on Twitter in that I don't fight with people because why? What's the point? What's the what's to be gained? What what would calling someone out do? What would privately insulting somebody do? What can possibly be gained? What minds can you change? What life can be improved by being negative or harsh on Twitter? I mean, I might whine a little bit about stupid, you know, timing or Bellator cards going till three in the morning, but it's different when you're going after people. And I can't understand for the life of me why people will go, yeah, this is in my best interest. I'm going to attack somebody privately because that totally won't get out. That that Jones responded in a DM and then promptly blocked her. And then blocked her. I mean, that points to one thing. He knows she's right. He doesn't like to hear it. He doesn't like to think about what it implies. But, I mean, that that's that's it. Yeah, I, that's a fair assessment right there. And as someone who has been negative on Twitter, as someone who does fight with people on Twitter from time to time and throw shots at people that I feel are, are deserving, I mean, there there are limits and lines that you simply do not cross. Yeah. It's 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 certain lines of human decency that are not to be crossed. One of those lines of decency is taking your medicine. If you do something that you are not supposed to do, if you are in a bad situation, you take your medicine. Uh, it, it, it's simple as that. So if I were to uh, be flagged on a police report for um, brutalizing my wife and their blood on the sheets and my children are, are crying for the police. Yeah, drag me on Twitter for that. Drag the hell out of me because I've done something to deserve it. It's that simple. I, you know, I, I, it's like, it's, it's like they want to live in a world without the consequences for their actions, you know, and, and I think Jones has been particularly sheltered from the consequences of his actions when you've been stripped from the title multiple times, but Hey, every time you come back, you're going to fight for that belt um, where you are, where the red carpet is rolled out for you, despite whatever you do where an event has literally moved across state lines to accommodate your mistakes. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we have a serious lack of accountability, and Jones is showing that. I think when Michael Graves' situation, I mean, his rant was so illogical and so bizarre. I mean, that just sounds like that sounds like the, the the rants and raves of a crazy person. Drugs or mental illness, yeah, you have to yeah. wonder. Yeah, that just sounds like someone who's clearly just out of their mind. Um, Jones, on the other hand, is is doing exactly what I would expect him to do in these situations when you haven't been checked, when you're surrounded by yes men. I mean, we look at um, uh, Mike Winklejohn uh, oh, disavowing himself yep. from Jones and banning him from the gym only to have Greg Jackson and Brandon Gibson. And, I, you know, Paul, Brandon Gibson, a, a guy I personally like, I, I respect Brandon a lot and I've had nothing but positive interactions with him. Um, so it pains me to say it, but hey, that's wrong to then go behind uh, Winkle John, who's trying to show some level of accountability to Jones and say, hey, we'll we'll train you privately we as long you. as you yeah, we'll, we'll as long as you, you act right. Um, no, no consequences for his actions. And this is the result attacking people for something that you've done. Make it make sense. Can't do it. Exactly. So. All right, gentlemen, uh, let's move on to the actual fights um, before we go on another uh, social justice rant. Oh, that drama was a lot more exciting than some of these fights that happened this week. Absolutely. Um, swing or miss, Aspen Ladd, Norman Dumont, the uh, main event at UFC Vegas 40, the worst UFC main event this year. How about it, Duffy? Uh, I mean, it was. it's the worst on paper. It was featured two women unranked in the weight cl- Or no, sorry. You know, Dumont was at least on the UFC rankings at uh, Featherweight. Uh, right. no, there, are no, in there are no the rankings. Person person. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Lad you know, was def- ranked the Bantamweight, but yeah, de- you know, definitely didn't deliver in the cage. I mean, you can you can make the argument that something like 
Edwards versus Muhammad was more disappointing. But yeah, I mean, this is the worst main event of the year. It it's it's the worst main event of the year. Probably the worst fight we've had in the main event since uh, Adesanya versus Romero all the way back a year and a half ago. Worst UFC main events on paper in probably five years. The only one I can think of this year that comes close is Cyril Gan Yarzin uh, Rosenstrike. Yeah. Because it was also an oddly similar approach of a jab taking a fighter completely out of their game. And that was more it's hard to it's hard to say because that gun rosen strike fight may have been more disappointing because it was a higher stake heavyweight fight whereas this is a featherweight fight where you know the winner is may fight amanda nunez sometime but may not and and because of that confusion as to how much it matters it it, it was worse it, it's we, we've talked about this before uh, about how fight cards uh, can when we talk about how good or bad fight cards are, they can have a hard cap or a hard ceiling depending on how noteworthy the bouts are. You know, a, a pay per view could be a 10 out of 10, where it's really hard to say UFC Fight Night 134 could be the best fight of the year, or best card of the year, when the number the, the, the main event is number five versus number nine. You know, it's having the big fighters people want to watch really makes a difference. So when it's two fighters, we're not really sold on watching the headliner do 25 minutes of that i think it's it's more disappointing and also the 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 output was less than rosa strike got so just in terms of the numbers perspective when nothing happens over the course of 25 uh difficult to watch minutes i'll say this will not be a fight i'll be watching over tape study anytime ever uh <laughs> probably makes it probably makes it the worst card my or worst main event of the year uh, yeah, I'm I'm swinging at this one and I'm knocking the ball clear out of the park. Um, like Rosenstruck and gone, like you said, is probably the closest we have to that. Um, but I think that was also the victim of our expectations to have two heavyweight kickboxers fighting one that's another. A, that's a really good point. Yeah, because what we got, it wasn't necessarily the most aesthetically pleasing, but we got something technical. We got something that we can pick from it and enjoy it uh to some level like if you if you are a technique head that was a good fight to watch this was not <laughs> you know this was not this was this was not necessarily a showcase of superior technique although you know no disrespect to what dumont was doing um out there i mean she did what she had to do to win she won and, the fight yeah she won the fight so so i'm not mad at that at all but we had low low expectations from jump not only was this just a random fight night card that was interchangeable with anything else that the UFC pumps out week in, week out. So your expectations are already low. Um, originally, it was supposed to be Holly Holm versus, versus Norma Dumont, which we weren't exactly high on anyway, because no real stakes to that fight. Um, if Holly Holm won, then it's like, all right, well, well she's going to get another chance to get cracked by Amanda Nunes. Um, and if Dumont won, OK, well, she's going to get a chance to get cracked by Amanda Nunes. And that was sort of it in a division that doesn't really exist. Um, then to have Aspen Ladd get slotted in, in at the last minute, well, I mean, expectations were even lower because, hey, she just came off this horrible, horrible weight cut where she looked like she was going to die on the scale. You know, she drinks a glass of water and they trot her back out uh, two weeks later. And he kind of expected her to not be herself, although she was at a, at a higher weight class. And it's still underperformed. You know, how many times have we said, and this is Dana's favorite thing to say at the podium after an event that everyone trashes in the, in the pre-fight talk, you know, man, you got to watch these fights and they'll deliver. Well, we watched this fight and it didn't deliver on that standard. And that was a pretty damn low standard for low standards. So this is bottom barrel level entertainment value. Um, the, the only entertainment value for this fight was, I think, the coaching. Yeah, which... Yeah, the the yeah, the coaching. Yeah, if, let's 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 go ahead and have that discussion because it's not much to talk about as far as the fight itself. What do you guys feel about the coaching advice that Lad was given in between rounds? What what are coaches name? Jim, Jim West, West Jim West. Okay, rough riders. No, you don't mean that. Go ahead. <laughs> I uh, I really don't have a problem with it. Uh, you know, I didn't even understand until afterwards that there was such outrage about it. Like I found it to be like kind of, as Jay said, the, the primary entertainment value of the fight. But even if I found it like problematic, or I was like, you know, kind of raising an eyebrow at it, 
I'm always going to be really slow to criticize coaching interactions like between rounds in a mixed martial arts fight because we are literally eavesdropping on 60 seconds of an interaction between people who have spent hundreds or thousands of hours together you know they develop their own rapport they develop in many cases their own coded language like how many times have you been watching a fight and been like why you know why is throw Greg sand throw sand yeah or why is greg jackson calling this guy by his full first middle and last name over and over again like these people have spent hundreds or thousands of hours together in a pressure cooker environment that's almost closer to family than like a boss employee relationship. Like there are bad coaches out there and certainly there are coaches that are better uh, coaching during a fight and between rounds than others, but it's not always easy to tell from, from what you overhear. We're like, again, again, we are literally eavesdropping on like real time interactions under duress by people who know each other a lot better than we know them. Uh, you know, otherwise a, a lot of like, you know, even your top coach interactions, they just don't sound like they make any sense, you know, and it's, it's just cause we don't know the whole story. And as someone whose job is to know the story for me to like, just come out and admit that and say, like, I'm not comfortable judging this. Cause I don't know the whole story. It takes a lot, but yeah, I, and I'm not caping for, uh, Jim West or MMA gold fight team at all. Like I, I think a good case can be made that Aspen Ladd would be better off with another team, but it's not because of what happened between rounds on Saturday. It's because of what's happened in every single one of her fights in the UFC. Be like, how, how does this woman still not have the weight cut nailed? That's a bigger problem. Like the bigger problem is Friday than Saturday. Among other things with that uh, coach student relationship. Yeah. That, okay. That, that is a very, very important thing to bring up. What exactly people are upset about. Are they upset that he yelled at her? Are upset that are they upset that he yelled at her, the fighter? Are they ups upset that they yelled he yelled at her, his girlfriend? Are they upset at the fact that that his advice wasn't actually advice? Um, is it the one of the issues I took was that he was asking her questions. I I don't again, Duffy, you're right. They know each other way better than any goof on their couch or work planner may know of their relationship, of their dynamic, of how things go in their communication level. But I've never really seen a Q&A session between rounds to be an effective form of, of cornering um, when, when there are adjustments to be made and they're not made, they're more 15 seconds of what are you doing out there. It, on the one hand, it could seem inspirational in the motivational sense like get out there you're losing really badly and i very much appreciate that he said you're losing that i think i, I think that i took I, I i think that was the most important message that he put out there even if the way he packaged it uh may not have, have sat well with everybody because you've seen corners go out there and say oh you're doing fine you're doing fine kid go out there another round of that another round of that and they may have lost two rounds already so by not putting that the stamp on it, you got to finish this fight, whatever they may say, they may coast to a decision where it's 30, 30, 27. And, and you go, well, clearly that coach should have let them know, hey, man. But whatever he said didn't work much because Aspen Led didn't have the energy, didn't have the ability, whatever it may have been to, to get out there and, and, and attack. And something Dean Thomas said, uh, I think after the fourth round, I think, because uh, we were discussing this live as the event was going on, about how maybe she should go get reckless. Maybe she should go crazy. Maybe she should stop doing the things she's doing that are obviously losing her this fight. Maybe just, just buck the system and attack and charge, whatever. You know, get hit on the way in, whatever it may be, to change things up. And I think that's what the corner should be for. And I think in that regard, the corner did fail her. Um, but as for the tone, as for the message... Yeah, what well, if you think that's bad? Listen to any what, what was it? Season three of The Ultimate Fighter. That was bad cornering. Uh, I'm I'm really I don't see what the problem is with the the corner advice. Like I get if if you you know like Ben, I understand like asking questions may not be the most productive thing. And like my brief time as a cornerman, I don't remember asking questions. I just remember telling my fighter what you know what I think needed to be done in that moment. But also, we don't like, like you said, we don't know the dynamics of that relationship other than the the more problematic aspects of Mr. Jim R. Pavel Barry West. Um, I, I'm I'm really 
that's I mean, that's really the problem with this whole thing to me. Um, the coaching itself in that moment, it's very clear some people have never done anything athletic in their lives. It's clear that some people have never been in a martial arts dojo or boxing gym or played on the football team or, or whatever and had an authority figure who knows more about the ins and outs of whatever activity it is that you are performing, yelling at you about what you're doing wrong. I, I think that's an experience. Us three have have spent our fair time in some level of athletics and we know what that's like. I know what it's like to have a coach yelling at me because I'm doing something wrong in sparring. And Jay, I know you've been yelled at by your karate instructor. And Ben, I know once or a thousand coach, times. Yeah. I know your wrestling coach, Ben, was yelling and screaming at you about something wrong. So um, that's just normal. That's par for the course. And you'd think with a high level athlete who's performing on a world stage, yeah, they've probably been fussed at by a coach once or twice in their life before, especially when they live with that coach and they've been groomed since uh, being a minor by said coach. So, yeah, I think she should go to train somewhere else, like AKA. Or, can, or, or can I like can I throw Kings something out there? May. As problematic as I I don't think the actual coaching was like there were no like obvious like red flags there. His apology was more of a red flag than anything because it was the I apologize, even though it wasn't my fault. Yeah. Like he li literally, I apologize, even though, you know, it probably wasn't my fault. Like that, like that to me was a, more of a red flag for a problematic professional and or personal relationship than anything that actually happened on Saturday. I mean, as, as you just heard, like I will, I will drag Jim West for the relationship with Aspen Ladd all day. Um, but the apology or faux apology I don't have a problem with because that just seemed like something to just shut people up. Just like, all right, just shut up. Like, this is, this is what we're doing. We're coaching. So just shut up and, you know, and go back to whatever you were doing that I quite honestly, that sounds like something I would do in, in that same scenario. I'll just be like, yeah, here, I'm going to put this out. So you just shut up and you leave me alone, or I'm just not going to say anything. Um, that seemed like a pretty logical response uh, in, in my opinion. And the latter, I think may, may end up being the title of this episode, just don't say anything. Like, don't go into DMs and yell at people. Don't don't talk trash about witches or gay people or whatever. Don't talk about how I'm really I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Just don't say anything. Just shut the hell up. It'll move on. There's a fight night card next week with Marvin Matori, who's going to say words, and Paula Costa, <laughs> who's going to say other words, and we're not going to like the words they're going to say. You will be forgotten by doing by the non-apology. And what's going on, you have put yourself in the news in a way that, that you would not be. If if Ali Abdelaziz had allowed Corey Anderson to go on the MMA hour, no big deal, it would have moved on. If he hadn't gone on and whatever, it didn't happen, it, it would move on. But by Ali sticking his nose into it, now it's a conversation. So that will remain in the news further than it would had something else happened. So just shut up. That's That's... The moral, the moral of the story, just, just me and everybody, just shut up. Yeah, on, on the heels of the um, the Black History highlight for noted civil rights leader Michael shout Chandler. Michael Chandler. Um, I, 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 I said something, just very plain statement that I think applies here now. Get your black belt and shutting the fuck up. So. Get your black belt, shutting the fuck up. Please train hard for that. I think that should be the lesson that we learn here. Just shut the hell up, please. All right, so fellas, let's um, let's keep things pushing here. We're going to move on to shallow cuts. We've got 30 seconds to answer a few questions. Let me go ahead and get the clock ready. Um, ben, you haven't assigned questions for some time. Uh, let's, uh, let's give you the baton. Um, yeah, ask me a question, sir. All right. Ant, how many more years will Andre Arlovsky uh, go, and does he get a ranked opponent next? He's won three of four. He's won five of seven. Hmm. Um, I think he can go as long as his chin holds up, which amazingly it seemed to have regrown yet again. Um, I don't think he gets a ranked opponent next, but I don't think that's too far in the future considering it is the heavyweight division, and Andre Arlovsky has a name. Really, he can keep going as long as his body holds up and as long he as he's willing to fight whenever the UFC asks him to, whoever the UFC asks him to fight. Um, he doesn't take the JDS route and have um, 
the the memory of being a champion. So I can't imagine he remembers being a champion. He's been knocked out four hundred times since then. <laughs> All right, Ben, uh, go ahead and pass the next question off, sir. Jay, you led off uh, the show today with a stat about Jim Miller. He says he wants to be the first only fighter in UFC history to fight at UFC 100, 200, and 300, which at the UFC's current pace should happen in about three years. Does it happen? 100%. There is no doubt in my mind that Jim Miller – the, the the wheels may be on fire and he may be skidding into the garage, but Jim Miller will make it to UFC 300 in, in 2025. I think early 2025. I have the, I have the thing in front of me somewhere. Um, yes, he will. And you know what? If he can good for him, he'll be younger than our Andre Olavsky is now. So it's not that, I mean, he's 155, but he never has had to rely on, you know, quick duck and move. So yes. All right. Nice one. Nice one. And this, oh, last thing, this will not be his final win. I'm, 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 I'm calling that now. He will win at least one more time on oh. the way to UFC 300. Not that he needs agree. to, because yeah. you know that he'll get like the BJ Penn oh, yeah. at least like a seven f- fight winless streak before they cut him, and that'll get him to UFC 300 by itself. Because it's just, well, if you his dependability the alone to make it Dude, yeah. in the cage, 38 UFC fights, going. zero weight misses. Yeah, yeah. man. If you if you look at the numbers right, he's four and three in his last seven. So it all depends on on how you you look at that. Go, he's got a five hundred record dating back the last three years, over five hundred yeah. record. Mm-hmm. All right. So Ben, um, you have a question. I guess I'll go ahead and ask that one. Um, did Norma Dumont shut down the featherweight division single handedly? No, I don't think it's fair to, to place that on here. There was no outcome from Saturday's fight that would have been a real win for the featherweight division. What if Ladd had starched Demont? Great. Ladd's probably going to still try to move back down to 135. What if Demont had done an F5 and like thrown Ladd out of the cage? Would you still pick her to beat Nunes? No, there's nothing Demont could have done to like save the featherweight division. So you can't blame her for shutting it down. All right. With, with seconds to spare, the only person who left time on the clock, Ben. <laughs> I, I am I am to the clock what Mackenzie Duran is to the scale. I have grown into a man who respects it, <laughs> you know, and lives within its bounds when I used to have problems. All it took was for you to give birth to a child, and now you're on point. There. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> awesome job. <laughs> All right, fellas. Um, I got to say, though, her beating – her, her uh, Nor- Dumont beating Felicia Spencer and Aspen Ladd, that I, I think that really did tamper down any future of 145 now. Yeah, I'm, I mean, but one in Not order that to it shut down future, a, but... yeah, exactly. In order to shut down a division, that division must exist. So, yeah. I mean, there's that. Um, yeah, we're 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 yeah we're we're talking about things that are hypothetical at this point. Bellator 268 also took place over the weekend. Madame Ninkoff and Corey Anderson have pushed their way to the finals of the light heavyweight Grand Prix, both with impressive finishes. The question I'm going to pose to you, gentlemen, is. Which performance was the most impressive out of the two? You know, I'm going to give the probably disagreed with answer and not say Corey Anderson getting out there and starching Ryan Bader. And it's not because Vadim Nemkov got cracked in the first round and dropped to a knee. And, it, and I went, oh my gosh, this is actually going to be an interesting fight. Now what we saw for the remaining, I don't know, 19 minutes, what is it, what is it, it wasn't a great fight. But the reason why Nemkov's win was so impressive to me is because he achieved a distinction that only one person ever had in Bellator. He's finished fights in the first round. He's finished a fight in the second round. He's finished a fight in the third round. He's now finished a fight in the fourth round. So this is a guy who can go, I'm going to, I'm we're done here and we're, we're going to wrap it up. And, and that makes him the kind of threat that makes uh, who uh, Corey Anderson, I guess is next makes it what happens when Corey Anderson gets past round three against a guy who he can't take down. And, and I am really curious to see that. But I, I think while I may favor Anderson to win, I'm higher on Nemkov now, even though Anglicus wasn't the guy. Duffy, am I wrong? Am I crazy? I, I love when I can tell you had a hard time picking your stat of the week, so you shoe her and your other stat in. Like, I did. <laughs> I definitely did. I definitely did. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I I, uh, it, I, I learned I learned more about Nemkov than I did about Anderson because – 
I, I even said ahead of this that I favored Anderson o- over Bader, but I did think Anderson was probably the highest ranked light heavyweight that Bader had as plausible an avenue to victory over as he did. But at the same time, if you told me Corey Anderson beat Ryan Bader, it was like this, just caught him early and just put him down. Uh, you know, the guy's got not many people at light heavyweight have underrated power, you know, but Anderson's like power is underrated at light heavyweight. Nemkov, I learned, I, I learned something about because he faced some adversity and he didn't just come back from it. It was as if it never happened. Like it was just like locked down, like vacuum seal tight after that. And once he, once he got back up off that knee, he won every minute of the fight and just really just finished it when he felt like it. Yeah. Like he's, he's a scarier, he's a scarier proposition. Now I, I haven't thought too hard about it yet. Cause the fight probably won't happen for another four months, but I'm probably going to be picking them going into this. And I, you know, let me just steer this this way. I know we're on a bit of a compressed time schedule, but Scott Coker says that the winner of this Grand Prix has a good case to be the best light heavyweight in the world. I'm not uh, disagreeing with him. If it's Corey Anderson, really? who has knocked out Jan Blachowicz, and John Jones is a, you know, desperate criminal heavyweight, like, who is the best light heavyweight in the world? You're a Prochaska. Yeah, who, he just got to win over, over Nemkov. Um, sure does. Yeah, so, I mean... God damn it. I mean, these cross promotional discussions like I first let me address the the first question here. Um, I'm more impressed by Nemkov simply because wow. the the I'm more impressed by someone showing dominance over time. You know, it, it, it seems like, you know, and no disrespect to Corey Anderson. I am I, I am a firm supporter of Corey Anderson. I think this is someone who deserved the title shot in the UFC. Uh, at at some point in the, in the not too distant past, and was passed over, and and he really should still be in the UFC now, uh, considering what his record was going out. But Nemkov showed to that he he was durable. He he went through adversity and he dominated and absolutely dominated. While it, it is impressive to catch someone early and finish them, that is sort of the dream for every fighter to just go in there and get it done take as little damage as possible and, and, and walk away with a bigger check. Um, from a technical standpoint, it's less impressive than just holding a man down and just doing whatever you want uh, for the better part of 25 minutes and or, or 20 minutes or so. And this fight ended what, in the fourth round. Yeah, mm-hmm. So about 20 minutes. Um, I, yeah. Nemkov, Nemkov gets the award uh, for me for for uh, Bellator 268. Did you see all the cuts on Anklikus's head? After the fight was over, yeah. holy crap! That wasn't just one that was bleeding here and there. <coughs> Dude had like barbed wire in his elbows. I don't know how that happened. I mean, you know, it's a bad day at the office when the commentary team is just coming up with something to talk about. You, you're on your back. You're just getting getting pal draft over and over again, and the commentary team is struggling to find something. And they just say, "Hey, yeah, this is a lost cause at this point." Whenever you hear a commentator say that, it is a lost cause, and it's time to just throw in the towel because um, for a, a group of people who their sole purpose is to drum up interest and to keep a viewer engaged and to and to dramatize what's going on in front of them when they can't even come up with anything <laughs> and just like, yeah, there's no way this guy's winning this fight now. <laughs> there's no way that guy's winning that fight now. So uh, there's that. Fellas, um, let's see. What else we got? Um it's time to ask um, a question here. How's Taste My Crow? Get your seasoning salt, get your cracked pepper, uh, and look over your picks from last week. How's Taste My Crow, Ben? Oh, man. You know, uh, my my biggest crow w- would be the main event. I expected Lad, even short notice, even up a weight class, to just be able to throw him on down and beat her up. She did nothing. Like just literally nothing. So, uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just keep it short. I was uh, unpleasantly, you know, like this is this is not good, Chrome. Yeah, yuck. Well, I'm gonna go a little further. I'm gonna go international like I did last time, and I'm gonna mix up a little brown sugar, some soy sauce, a little <laughs> bit of ginger. Probably throw in some garlic and go go Mongolian this time because for whatever reason, whatever crazy reason, maybe it's because I actually had seen all of his fights on the regional stage. Now, after he left the UFC, and even though the the competition wasn't spectacular, the striking he put on display was more impressive than I ever seen it. I thought that Brandon Davis would be able to get by uh, Danan Bakarai from Mongolia, and he didn't at all. 
even for a second in, in, in any in any way in any possible reason i don't know if he landed much i don't know anything but he got destroyed he got run through he's i think two and seven in the ufc now in his second stint back is, is killer b davis and uh Bakarad, man he may be someone to watch in the division or it's brandon davis is struggling we'll, we'll find out soon all right, nice. Um, I can't say I really had any picks for last week because I just didn't get too invested in any of the fights. I mean, probably the closest was I no no Ben Henderson over Prim Primus. Uh, no, I mean, no, no, not not quite, not not quite. That was that was one that was yeah, no, not really. Um, I mean, I guess the closest is probably the Corey Anderson and Ryan Bader fight. I. Just when first hearing the matchup, I thought like, yeah, I, I think Ryan Bader wins that. But even still, it, maybe I'm more shocked by the knockout than anything else. But whatever, um, that didn't that didn't quite move me enough to to be worthy of grow. Um, so instead, I'll start things off with the best title segment in all of media history. I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons. This is where we share something that surprised us, or ironically, did not over the course of the past week. And we did mention it already, but I'll just go ahead and use it for my, uh, I'm not surprised anyway. And that is Corey Anderson, um, the subject of a lot of discussion this week. He was scheduled to make an appearance on the MMA hour with Ariel Hawani, only to be pulled in the 11th hour due to his manager, Ali Abdel Aziz, who I, I just don't understand it. If you are the manager your job is to do things in the best interests of your client. If your client has an appearance on one of the most popular shows in the sport, the, the most, most popular, popular show in the sport. Um, and this is off the heels of one of the biggest wins of your career. And the first title opportunity that, that, that you had, or the first title opportunity. Did he fight for the battle title before? I don't believe he did. No. Cause they gave him like a BS matchup coming in against Melvin Manhoff. Yeah. Manhoff, so yeah. yeah, your first, title shot and instead of enjoying publicity instead of getting your flowers instead of drumming up interest in your client you say no let's keep whatever feud is going going and my guy can't be on your show because hey people watch it and we don't want that to happen i'm not surprised mr falcons and i should be because hey mma managers try you know managing (sighs) i'll go all right yeah, which sure I'm not surprised, Mister Falcons. Ben. Well, I'll you know I'll I'll roll it back to the whole uh, Aspen Lad controversy with which we uh, opened the show. Uh, you know, speaking of getting a black belt and, and shut the fuck up, one of the people who kind of piped up about it was uh, former UFC bantamweight champion Misha Tate, who who was very critical of the uh, uh, of the coaching between rounds. Now, considering that one of the very best things that Jim West did was give his charge an accurate representation of how the fight was going and that Misha Tate's own most famous cornering moment was telling Brian Caraway to coast because he was ahead against Rafael Asuncao only to lose the fight. Like, like, woman, know thyself. This was one case where your opinion was not needed. Like, like, why? Of all the things that I was reminded of this week, I was reminded of Caraway Asuncao and I was reminded that, uh, that fucking Michael Graves is even even a thing on this planet. Like, just weak ruined. <laughs> I'm going right now to the Sherdog Fight Finder to change Michael Graves' uh, nickname to Doug My Own. <laughs> <laughs> I approve. <laughs> oh my god! Jay, we're sure I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcon's moment this week. Well, I'm leaving the most most of the major news. I'm leaving the UFC, leaving Bellator behind. I'm going to my best buddies, my my beloved friends over at One Championship, because how is it that the dumbest, for my eyes, the dumbest thing that can come out of the sport this week may not have been from a somebody who's actually involved in competing or running a show or doing anything of merit other than that that kickboxing show where Petrosian got just absolutely iced, but that's not the point here. So news has trickled out, and and, and it turned into a deluge when UFC fighter Estela Nunes uh, mentioned when she fought Angela Lee in one championship, uh, Lee was cutting a ton of weight, missed weight for the fight, and 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 therefore it's a whole mess. But but one swept it under the rug, and of course that that 
that sent everybody to go, well, actually, Angela Lee has missed weight many times. Cuts weight all the time. Here's pictures of her in a sauna talking about her cutting weight and her weight cut session before she's getting ready for a title fight. And more accusations and allegations came out. Well, actually, she had missed weight for title fights. And one championship either swept it under the rug or on one accusation paid off the other fighter a fee or sum or percentage to allow them to A, fudge the numbers and say the title fight is still going on, and two, not talk about it. So one championship, why? What are you doing? Why do you keep doing it? Why why do we why do I have to talk about this? Why why can't you just just not? I mean, this this is a this is almost the opposite of why can't you shut the hell? Why don't you say something? Address it. Have public weigh-ins. Show the things so we stop having to wonder. Because if, if you're just going to keep pulling this shady nonsense, how can we even take you seriously? Angela Lee could be a bantamweight for all we know. Should we start ranking her at 135 pounds? Because that's probably what she's fighting at. I don't know. But one championship, y'all stop. Stop goofing. One 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 championship intern watching the show. Get at me. I have a couple ideas how to stop being so stupid. So in other words, Chautry, stop being Chautry. Um, wow. Uh, so let's, let's keep things pushing. I mean, I, no one is startled by that news. That was a perfect, I'm not surprised because no one is I surprised. I am so by, not by surprised, that. Mr. Hawkins. <laughs> I mean, we could have, we could have just got on the show and just said, that's what was going on about, about two, three years ago, um, when we first started doing this. But anyway, um, let's, let's keep things pushing here. Cause we're running super low on time. We've got Bellator in Russia this week. Um, Fedor Emelianenko takes on Tim Johnson in quite a head scratcher. Uh, of matchmaking why is this the the fight that bellator had made for fedor's last so-called last appearance in russia according to josh gross it's because fedor selected this fight now i don't know why i don't know why he would do this other than the guy ahead of him in bader is busy and the guy ahead of uh, right below bader is is his you know training partner valentin modovsky but this makes no sense. What happens if Fedor wins? Does he fight for a title in his last fight where he's clearly saying, I'm done here after my after my second my second fight? Why couldn't Bellator have brought in any of the names that are much interesting? Then Tim Johnson, a dangerous, durable test who will brawl with Fedor and something can happen. Or what's the downside? Fedor gets smoked in Moscow in front of Tim Johnson by Tim Johnson? Like I like Tim John, I like Tim Johnson more than most. I've been following this here for a long time, but there is no upside to this at all. Did he think they meant Tim Sylvia? Maybe. I mean, you, you, you like I, I mean, you couldn't like lure JDS away from AEW for for a second here. Like I, I have a hard time believing that he was even given a a, a serious offer for this because I have a. I don't understand a world where JDS decides, oh, you know what? I'm going to do this pro wrestling thing uh, just as a one off, just for some fun, instead of, you know, potentially knocking out the the consensus greatest, one of the consensus greatest heavyweights of all time on his home turf. And that will be such a crowning achievement for an already legendary career. I don't I, I don't understand how, how that doesn't happen. I, I, I could only think to the asking price of Tim Johnson. But they're in Russia with a full house in the VTB arena. There's a lot of people there. That's a big gate. Yeah, so yeah. they could have they could have thrown coin to, to get Anderson uh, to get Anderson Silva, to get Alistair Overeem, to get JDS, to get Josh Barnett. Josh Barnett. Like we've only been trying to get that fight going for the last, you know, 85 years or whatever the case may be. And, and if you finally Josh do Barnett it in pops, an unregulated place. Thank, yeah, that, thank you. Yeah. If, if Josh <laughs> I know, you, yeah, pops, you finally don't Russia. have to worry about the You're things that have derailed this fight before. Yes. So and, and losing this fight wouldn't kill the promotion. Yeah. So yeah. R- ridiculousness. Um, but hey, we'll we'll still watch it apparently. All right, you'll see fight night 196. I think that's UFC Vegas 41 is coming up this weekend as well. Um, the main event is held between the uncrowned champion Marvin Vittori and the wine master, Paulo Costa. Um, what do we make of this this main event, fellas? That's a nice play on words there. Like, cause Paulo Costa, like he, he's all about both kinds of wine. Dude, th- this, this should be like UFC fight night 196 mute the TV the whole time. Like that should be the tagline for this. Like 
I mean, honestly, it's it's a good main event. It's a divisionally relevant main event, which I mean, obviously, we've been short of those on the on the free fight night cards recently. So it's a good main event, just between two really really prickly guys, and honestly, should probably be a really good fight. I'm excited for it. Yeah, I, I like the matchup. I like I like this getting put together the way it is, and it's it's five rounds. And I like the idea of two fallen title challengers coming head to head to figure it out as long as the winner doesn't get the title shot in their next performance like as long as they don't paula costa doesn't knock out Vittori and get another title shot i am all aboard this fight i if they can do that and rank to to try and build that up i'm okay with that but this could be a this could be a mess i do not think you will have to meet the tv i think espn will be muting the broadcast because of the profanity ahead of time you know my only complaint with this fight is that this should be on a pay-per-view card this should be on the main card of pay-per-view simply to see these two at a press conference together. Like I want, I I'm oh, okay. That would be fun. Grant Dawson and Ricky Glenn should be the main event simply so we can have, we can have Costa and Batori sitting on the dais and yelling and arguing at each other. Also some nonsensical crap. That's what I want. That's the only problem with this fight. Sign me up. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to lean toward uh, Costa winning this. Um, but I don't know. I mean, these, these, these guys, there's, there's not a lot of fight IQ to be had in, in the cage for this one, but there's a whole lot of testosterone. There's a whole lot of stupid. I like it. So, um, sign me up, but I, I, I'm guess I'm going to lean toward cost of hesitantly, uh, which, what's, what's your pick before we wrap things up? I'm actually right, leading Vittori. Um, you know, I I think Vittori will be able to get inside of the range where Costa really wants to operate, maybe even get him down on the ground. Uh, and even though Costa is a gigantically swole middleweight, like, is there a guy who more obviously gets above his weight class between camps than Paulo Costa? Uh, I, I think Vittori will be able to get, kind of bully him a little bit uh, in close quarters. That's what I'm expecting. Okay. Yeah, I I think I'm leaning towards Vittori here uh, because of pressure and, and a lot of clenching. I, I, I don't know if people would get Costa down because Costa's got tree trunks when everything's a tree trunk for Paul Costa praising. Um, but I, I just think he's he's kind of like how Aspen Ladd tried to take down Norman Dumont but just couldn't because he was too big and too strong. I think that might happen. Uh, I don't think Costa's going to be able to want, be the one to crack the chin if Asanya can't do it twice. So yeah, I think I'm leaning towards Vittori for now. All right. Well, should be uh, an action packed fight anyway, and we deserve it after what happened last week. So, um, that's going to do it for this edition of Unleashed. Big thanks to Ben and Jay every week for holding it down here on the Walkout Network. Um, you can find them on SureDog.com. And I'm I'm imagining, Jay, you're on play-by-play -play duty again. Sure enough. And Ben, you're probably going to be uh, scoring the fight for the site as well. Scoring, doing post-fight recap, probably writing a bunch of stuff. Like it's an all-hands-on-deck weekend this week just because there's so much stuff going on. But, yeah. KSW right, well, and then yeah, there's KSW, the yeah, Russia. And then there's Ryzen and... Yeah, we got it. Yeah, it's a busy, it's a busy week. So next week we definitely will have a lot to talk about on the international scene as well, um, including how awesome Alex Casera's Sung Woo Choi is going to be. Oh yes, yes, say. yes. That that actually I'm really looking forward to that. So um, you can check them out on Sure Dog. You can find me on MMA on Point. Uh, Twitter handles are below. So like, subscribe, share, tell a friend to tell a friend, tell that friend to tell ten more friends. Stay beautiful, stay positive, get your black belt, and shutting the fuck up. Stay sexy. I'll see you when I see you. Peace.